Our guest in this segment is the chairman of the Roundhouse Authority, Matt Umstead, who has uh, had many hats in his career, including that of uh, a reporter for a local newspaper in which he was considered to be, as they say, a damn good one. Mr. Umstead, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. How are you? We're well. Uh, how's life treating you these days? It's uh, very busy. Uh, we are very busy at the Roundhouse these days. Um, a lot going on. Hey, explain the power structure in terms of the running of the Roundhouse day-to-day -day operations, long-term planning. Who's all involved in that? Well, we actually have two boards. We have two two different boards of directors. One is our Berkeley County Roundhouse Foundation, which is our 501c3 charitable uh, arm, which does fundraising and um, uh, you know different events to uh, gets involved with um, grants, uh, you know, applications for whenever a 501c3 is the required uh, requirement for the application. So they get involved in different types of fundraising, um, the traditional and and some, some grant funding applications. Um, and then uh, that board is a nine-member nine board, <clears throat> and uh, it's a it's a nonprofit organization with the IRS and everything. And we have a great treasurer, Clyde Young, with Cox Holiday Young, and he uh, does a great job for us, uh, keeping us uh, square with the IRS. And um, and then we uh, also have the Roundhouse Authority, which is the um, the uh, governmental entity that actually owns the owns the property. Um, it uh, was formed by act of the legislature, and it uh, is a board that can range in size, and uh, uh, members to that board are appointed by the governmental entities here, the City of Martinsburg Martin and Berkeley County Commission. Um, uh, other governmental entities in the region could also possibly potentially appoint members if they decided that they wanted to start making regular contributions um, to 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 the authority, um, but they have not done that over the years, over the last 24 years that the authorities existed. So when it comes um, when it comes to making a decision, Matt, how quickly can things get done? Um, well, the, the the foundation can act fairly quickly because it's it does not it does not have to uh, it's not held back by uh, public notice and requirements and um, you know. Uh, posting of agendas that are, uh, you know, rules for governmental entities. Uh, governmental entities have to follow all the public notice rules and advertising rules, and, and um, obviously ethics apply on both boards, but uh, when it comes to the actual uh, proceedings and things like that, the, the Roundhouse Authority is, is slower, um, and, but the foundation can act fairly quickly um, on any given um issue really um there's there's a there's a discussion of uh underway i can't really say a whole lot about it but um to kind of uh, make a kind of a change uh in how the day-to-day -day business um and uh, just overall operations on a day-to-day -day basis are handled and, and managed uh involving the foundation um and we're talking with some legal folks about doing that um to kind of improve the uh, general understanding and uh, uh, community engagement uh, between the roundhouse and and the public, and uh, so that's something that's that if we're given the green light um, and everything, everybody is satisfied, should make things a lot more easily understood and um, uh, engaging, uh, engagement friendly uh, between the roundhouse and the community. So we're hopeful. Uh, some some positive things uh, in that regard. Matt, what kind of progress is being made there in terms of planning and, and actual work uh, in terms of uh, making that property reach its full potential? Uh, yes, we actually have um, our elevator. Uh, we have a, a market plan. We have a, a year-round market uh, project plan and a uh, farmer's market, as some of you all might have heard about. Um, the farmer's market's been on site for now a year and a half. It's been growing, very successful. Uh, we uh, are on track to have more, have more than $100,000 in sales this year at the farmer's market. Um, 
that's the seasonal market. And then there's the other half of that uh, component to have a year-round marketplace inside uh, what they call the Bridge and Machine Shop, which is one of the three primary buildings. And uh, that Bridge and Machine Shop uh, is being equipped with HVAC, uh, heating, air, heating and air conditioning, um, and uh, an elevator steps. Uh, it already has permanent bathrooms uh, attached or not attached, but right next to it. Uh, and so that, that project is coming, uh, is making, uh, significant advancements. Um, as we speak, the elevator, uh, is actually undergoing some inspection, some final inspection steps. Um, it's, uh, literally at that stage. Um, and the uh, air conditioning project is, is, is about 80% complete. It's been a little bit held up by some electrical, um, some electrical issues um, that need to be addressed um, before we can uh, get the HVAC online. Um, but the second floor of that building, which is a, an event space, uh, we're also moving fairly quickly to have that available for rental and for use uh, as an event space, which will be uh, an occupancy of up to 300 people. Um, so that'll be a new event event hall in the downtown uh, for available for events for up to 300 people. Uh, as of the more immediate availability will be seasonal use because we won't have air conditioning there yet. Probably um, uh, it'll be a few more months or so before we have air conditioning. But um, uh, but uh, the availability of the space will be. It's at least on track for now to be coming fairly quickly here in the in the early fall. And that's the longer rectangular building, Matt. Yeah, it's running parallel to the railroad. Uh, it runs parallel to the railroad generally, um, and faces uh, faces kind of uh, the track uh, on a very broad, long wise long way. Okay, so. Uh, that's the that's the one that would be away from the ruins then, not the longer one that's closer to the right. It, it, yeah, it's on the north end. It's the north. It's the north side yeah. of the roundhouse. If you're looking from across the tracks uh, from the train station area, the Martinsburg train station. If you're looking across the tracks, it's the one on the left. And then and it's the north end. Yep. And what are the plans for the longer one that's perpendicular to the railroad? Uh, on the on the, the south of the roundhouse is a it, uh, is a is a building known as the Frog and Switch Shop, and currently houses the the farmers market, um, which has been growing and uh, g you know gaining uh, momentum with every passing week. It seems um, we had the commissioner of agriculture there Saturday uh, visiting with us, and, uh, and we had over 60 some uh, businesses there for Christmas in July. It was uh, about 800 people there. Um, uh, for the market, for a four-hour market, which is really, really amazing. Uh, it's a great atmosphere, and we invite the community to come down. Um, that building, uh, there's been some conceptual designs done to also uh, make the frog and switch the building to the right of the roundhouse from the tracks. If you're looking across the tracks, it's the building to the right of the roundhouse. Um, it's uh, been kind of envisioned to be an event space as well. Um, but it's just a one-story building, so you walk in, and that's the one open space. It's a 15,000 square feet space. Um, it's all open floor. There's no beams coming to the floor. It's completely wide open. Um, there's been conceptual drawings done by an architect for that. Uh, there's been estimates for that project as to how much it would cost to to, to make it an, an event space. Um, those estimates are now a couple years, well, they're about three years old now, but uh, so roughly that project combined with the amphitheater is estimated to cost about roughly about three and a half, four million. Um, uh, so, you know, those, those numbers are, are dated at this point, but uh, somewhere in there. Um, so, uh, the, yep. No, Matt, this is John Gilstrap. So let's talk about yep. the, the amphitheater a, a little bit. Um, yeah. How do you envision that venue being used? Is this a concert venue, or is it a? What do you see it as? Well, uh, the designs uh, by uh, Crabtree Robal Associates out of uh, well, they have an office in White Sopper Springs. They they provided a, a, 
you know, an estimate on that and, and kind of a configuration as to how it would look. Um, yeah, it looks open a, air. I'm looking at your website. It's, it's kind of open air. It's kind of cool looking, actually. Yeah, it's an open air. Uh, it's an open air facility um, utilizing the ruins of the East Roundhouse, which burned in 1990 before uh, the property was owned by the taxpayers. As I tell people all the time, if, you, if you're confused about anything, just know that this is this property is currently owned by the taxpayers. It's, it's it's a publicly owned property. So, uh, but we we really believe in the amphitheater project as a community engagement, um, uh, welcoming um, attraction to bring people in and and obviously coax them into learning about the history of their community, essentially, um, and railroad history in particular. So, uh, the you know the architects did some initial concepts. Um, it's fairly basic. The they're they're not. A, Obviously, fully designed, but the the amphitheater estimate just by itself back in uh, this 2021 February um, February estimate was uh, just for the amphitheater was approximately 1.5 million dollars, and that was the concrete floor, the bleachers, roof over the bleachers, structural stabilization, and roof of the stage. Um, so, it, it, you know, that was February 2021. I mean, obviously, it's a lot more than that probably by now because of inflation and everything else. So, but still not really uh, a terrible. I mean, when you look at the cost of other public entities and their projects in the, in the community here, 1.5 million, 2 million, 3, even 3 million really isn't a lot, even if that's what the cost is today. Uh, at least that's my view. I mean, obviously, when you say million, that's still a lot of money. Um, and, uh, you know, but the, the community benefit would be tremendous. Uh, we really believe in that. And uh, uh, if you build it, they will come. And, and we really feel like this would really be a trigger for, you know, propelling the completion of all the other work that, that needs to be done. An area our size needs a venue. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, every other place has some sort of a venue, and we, we don't here in Berkeley County. Yeah, and, and and we think, I mean, you know, we think the capacity, you know, it's a 12.94 acre parcel there. You know, the roundhouse property sits on about 13 acres. And, and then there's the ancillary areas across the pedestrian bridge, which the city was able to get, you know, constructed to, add, to connect us to downtown. There's some more connectivity that could occur that would make this a very walkable, accessible a site as well, but but just for the capacity to park cars in the downtown area and come to a, a show or a performance at the amphitheater from from downtown, uh, we just think there's a lot of capacity for parking. Uh, yeah, there's always room for event parking improvements. Um, in you know in the downtown, in my view, as a citizen, uh, you know when you have the Apple Harvest Parade, where do you park? You know where's the event parking? Day-to-day uh, -day parking, it's great. There's not, I've never had a problem with day-to-day -day parking in downtown. But event parking downtown, when it's a big event, I mean, that's a question I don't know. You know, maybe there's some privately owned parking lots that can become temporarily public uh, where people can make money off of some, some temporary event park, parking opportunities. Um, you know, I, I don't know. But uh, if we build an amphitheater there, I think that, uh, you know, event parking could be something that would be, you know, obviously something that may, may need to be looked at a little bit more. Um, but we think it can be accommodated. Um, Have you guys talked about paving the parking lot that, that was used, like, for the home show? The uh, restrictions, um, uh, there's, a, there's an invisible what none of these drawings show is there's an invisible line. It's called the National Historic Landmark Boundary. And the boundary the boundary is actually existing. It, it actually encapsulates or, or surrounds the primary buildings. So the three primary buildings and, and the ruins, it surrounds them. And that boundary is is a, is a, is a, an impediment to paving. Uh, anything inside that boundary is is pretty much off limits. For paving, and things that are outside that boundary are more flexible. So there is an opportunity to pave there on the roundhouse property, I believe. At least that's my understanding from the, our state uh, guide guide I mean, guidance. I, I think it, it would um, be it would make it a lot more attractive, and oh it would, sure, and it would Absolutely. make it it would make us it seem a lot more put together. I mean, most yeah, most yeah. historical yeah. places have a have a parking lot. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the National Historic Landmark 
and that's the key that a lot of people don't really grasp really. It's there's only 17 national historic landmarks in West Virginia. So most people don't encounter them. They don't really encounter national historic landmarks. Harpers Ferry, when you go to Harpers Ferry Park, National Historic Park, that's not none of that's a landmark. None of that in Harpers Ferry. Yeah, it's a national park, but it's not a landmark. And and that's a difference. That's a very key difference that a lot of people don't really really grasp because the restrictions on preserving it as it is are very, very, very greatly heightened. And so when we asked about paving the road that leads up to the property uh, in on the track side as it faces the tracks, you know, that area, they said, no, we, we would we would prefer, very much prefer that to remain gravel. Now, on the back side, on where it's outside of that invisible boundary, uh, you know, to to create some satellite parking on on the north end or south end, or or have an access road that comes on the back side of the property that you don't really see, that's an, that's that's another question altogether. What kind of support are you getting from the politics politicians within the city? Because I know that in the run up to the elections, a lot of folks were talking about a lot of the the, the candidates for city council were talking about increasing the art uh, infrastructure within. The city. I mean, this plays the amphitheater in particular plays right into that. I would think. Yeah. Um, well, I, I have to say, and I, I, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but I will. I will just state the positives, and I will say this: uh, Ward Two Councilman uh, David Harburg has been a uh, ardent, very steady supporter of ours at the Roundhouse of the Farmers Market. Uh, he's very much involved, very engaged, very supportive. Um, you know, he's he's been there through and through since day one, and uh, just couldn't say enough uh, thank yous to him about his support for what we're doing. Um, you know, there's other degrees of support after David that, uh, you know, there's some folks that have come here and there um, to stop by and say hello. And, uh, you know, friendliness, uh, uh, like Kimberly Nelson, she stopped by and visited a few times. Um, the new council a woman at large, uh, um, Miss Crawford, uh, Heidi Crawford, uh, Gibbons Crawford, uh, if I'm saying that right, she stopped by and, and said hello and met her and talked with her a little bit, hope to follow up with her a little bit. She also lives in Ward 4, and this is – our property is in Ward 4 of the city. Um, it is uh, in Ward 4, and uh, Miss Kimberly Nelson and uh, Heidi both uh, – Miss uh, Crawford, uh, Gibbons Crawford both live in Ward 4. So – we're hopeful to, you know, continue to grow our relationship with them and make sure they're aware of what, uh, you know, what our, you know, needs and what we would like to do and how to be a partner with a, a better, a, a better partner with the city as well and, um, you know, continue to grow and build the relationship there. It's historically not been a really um, strong relationship. I would say previous council members that were pretty engaged, like uh, the late councilman Roger Lewis, uh, uh, the late councilman Richard Yager, uh, they were tr very steady and, and they're uh, attending a me our meetings and being engaged and keeping in touch with what we were doing. Um, other council members maybe were, not, were less engaged at that time. I, I would say I feel like we have more support and more interest from members of city council today than we than we have in the past which is a good thing and we obviously want to have a strong relationship with the city uh, the county commissioners have been rock steady and and helping us financially uh, with our insurance which is now 29,000 plus annually uh, to insure our buildings um, it's that's uh, something the county has graciously um, been supportive of and, and helped uh, basically pay for our building insurance, which we could not be, we would not be there if we did not have insurance um, on these buildings. And the county has stepped up and and not hesitated to fund that insurance uh, cost for us. Um, so, you know, it's, it's. Uh, I, I, I think the relationships are, 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 are better than they were in the past. And I think there's opportunity for, for even more uh, stronger relationship. Talking to Matt Umstead, chairman of the Roundhouse Authority. Is this property on the state's list for for uh, tourism and economic development, Matt? Um, we have engaged with uh, 
I have a relationship with Secretary Ruby at the Department of Tourism, and uh, we've had some engagement with with her department about um, staging uh, some activities, events to promote West Virginia tourism at our site uh, in connection with an event um, there. Um, you know, we are we are registered with the Department of Tourism. Um, we're, we have a profile on their website, and all of our information is on there. And so, you know, the C Convention and Visitor Bureau, which is like a local partner with the Department of Tourism, they uh, they also have been a tremendous uh, s supporter and partner with <clears throat> you know grant funds for different events that we've re held and things like that. So, I, I think we're in a we're in a pretty we have a pretty good relationship there, but it also can you know continue to improve as well. I think one of the biggest challenges is you know we we have a 13 acre acre site and you know uh, we don't have a you know dedicated revenue stream to to really uh, activate um, what all is possible there. Uh, is the real key is is getting this. Uh, uh, bridge of machine, this uh, you know the elevator steps inspection, you know that that building, uh, and the HVAC, uh, getting that building to where we can have tenants in there generating revenue, and year-round revenue, and then and then at that stage, then we really do have something to really um, to really uh, you know stabilize and really move forward in a very uh, very good uh, stable. Uh, way um, uh, that's been the challenge. I mean, the Matt, legislature. Oh, yes. Sorry, I was looking at the plans and everything. It look amazing. I got a question. What is a frog shop? I've a frog is is, is well. If you imagine, this is going to be. I don't want to get too graphic, but if you smash a frog on the road on a highway, the the legs kind of go and uh, kind of think of it as like an X. You know, like a like a weird shaped X. And uh, the railroad, where the where the railroads kind of, where the tracks kind of kind of intersect, it kind of creates like a, a weird, uh, a strange looking X. And uh, it, they call them frogs. I don't know why, but they're part of the active track line. And, and the, the, when they did the frog and switch, the switches were to switch a train from one set of tracks to another set of tracks. You flip the switch, and it, it moved the tracks physically. And and you would it would send the track send the train down a different set of tracks, and the frog is is part of that is part of that uh, system on the actual actual active track line. Nice. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to explain. There's some diagrams we have on display. We have our exhibits up uh, during the farmers market, and you know the visitors we've gotten. Um, like I said, we had 800 so people coming in on Saturday last Saturday for the farmers market, but we have a lot of exhibits and a lot of historical exhibits up, and people come in and are able to see and um, kind of take a self-guided tour around the, around our our roundhouse and see it. And I'm of course there, and other volunteers are there to kind of talk about and you know the history and stuff. And Matt, you know, on that note, I got to jump in because I just ran out of time. I want to thank okay. you for yours. Learned a lot about sure. the Roundhouse today and its future sure. plans. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Matt Umstead, Chairman of the Roundhouse Authority. Good questions there, guys, and uh, good information from Matt.